think that, you know, finding that special collaborator makes the whole composition and performing process like that much more enjoyable and, and the, the, the product memorable. We're trying to address this idea of like the collaborative process and, and, and these cultivate or, or pieces, we're talking about these individual pieces, we're not a result of like you know, Marcos, Marcos Walter and, and Ryan Monster just sitting in the same room like, all right, right, Wicker Park. But this is like a relationship that was curated over time, over dozens of pieces and, or, and dozens of collaborative projects. So um, for someone that, that wants to get uh, started in this sort of commissioning um, process with a composer or collaborator, do you have any like sort of tips as someone that's been on both sides? of this? Okay, so there's like, eight things that come to mind immediately, and I don't know if any of them are more important than the others, um, <laughs> or if they're all just part of the same whole in some kind of way. But um, one of them is not being afraid, <laughs> um, or being afraid and recognizing it, or anxious, whatever it is, recognizing it for what it is, and then doing it anyway. Um, because, And I'm talking about, as a composer, walking up to a performer, <laughs> <laughs> after they've done something or on the performer side too um if you like like a composer and want to ask you know there's other barriers there too you're like what if they're too big of a name and like you know they have too much reputation or whatever else and like they wouldn't work with me or anything i think there's a lot of barriers there that we inherently just put up um around social interaction <laughs> Um, between these things. And a lot of it, I think, you know, is perpetuated by all of us, no matter what music facet we're doing. It, a lot of it is really solitary. Like, we're in a practice room for multiple hours a day. We're writing on a computer alone in a room for multiple hours a day until we get to these moments of collaboration um, with other people, which I, it's fine. It's great. It's part of the process. But all of that explains think a little bit why it might be hard to get that, that initial thing going um i think for younger composers um one of the best advice things that anyone ever gives you is go to as many recitals as you can as many concerts as many musical experiences like not necessarily recital recital even like go to a club go to the low like the local live band listen to your jazz department listen to like all of these other things that happen around because all you can learn from all the music and either you learn what you like about it or you learn what you're not going to do, <laughs> which, you know, is great. But if you're not paying attention and you're not listening in the first place, you don't, you don't even get to that step. Like a lot of advice I was given was like, you know, go to your friend's recitals, go to your friend's friend's recitals and make sure you stay after. There are things that you're going to have liked though, you know? Um, and so you go and you voice those things. You, um, you're like, that same song was amazing. How did you do that? <laughs> you know, like all of these things or like, I really liked your programming or whatever you want to talk about. You just have to go up there and you know, cause how many people on the performing side, like not many, I feel like not a lot of, we don't get a lot of opportunities to perform one. And whenever we do, we don't get to talk about it with anyone except for those little brief moments. So like, especially if you're a composer and you know, and on the performing side, I mean, that's, one of the easiest, greatest ways to do it. Um, things like this, where you can meet virtually, I think has become a lot bigger of a thing. So I think more people are open to um, more cold call, kind of like got a random Facebook message from someone wanting to do a masterclass or like wanting to collaborate on a piece or something like that. I think people are way more open to that now because they realize how well this form of collaboration can still work virtually. Once you have that like that initial contact that like kind of friendship thing i think the most important thing is to be genuine and to be yourself um and to make it not about what they're playing not about what you write the relationship you're making is a friendship you're not making a transactional process where you're gonna go and be like hey your denisov was really good i really like that you play really high and really fast and it's great I write really high and really fast and you know, I think it's cool. Do you want to play it? Like that's, that's not how it happens. It's wow. Denisov was great. I thought you really emoted there. Like, what were you feeling? You know, how do you feel about that performance? What's going on? You know, like something that gets to the actual person and shows that you care 
and then invites a conversation where they can ask those things back and like you can just start being friends you know go get a beer after do whatever um but don't make it about business up front um and like let the business part happen organically i think is the other thing and i say business loosely i mean the writing the art that's what we're doing here um let that happen organically once you've got the friendships because i think um someone will be way more willing to go to bat for you play your music get the word out do any of those things um if y'all have a genuine connection and like our friends and you can like call like something like this even <laughs> where i'm like hey jeff um <laughs> You know, like uh, those are the kind of relationships you want to foster and that you want to build and make. Um, and that will lead you to um, repeat performances. They'll in introduce you to someone else to collaborate with or all of these other things. But um, like it starts with you being genuine. And sometimes, you know, that's hard. Like that's another barrier that's like hard to get past. Um, it's also hard with performers sometimes like sometimes you can feel like you're being really really open and you get a wall back and that happens you know people are weird people are different most composers are weird um so <laughs> <laughs> just like know that going into it know that we're weird and we're okay with it and it's gonna be fine um performers are plenty weird too like let's be honest like <laughs> no one's exempt from the weirdness <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're all doing this, right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> for looking to collaborate first that those are my main tools so far is um recognize your intrusive thoughts get get over them if you can make those connections become friends with people the, the way that has worked out for me is i just have close friends <laughs> that happen to also play horns or whatever they do or conduct or whoever and i mean like i'm collaborating with um hannah bossenolt um she's a master's student at michigan right now and she hasn't been writing me this electroacoustic piece um, with saxophone and electronics. And like, we worked on it for almost six months for parts of last year and then like some this year, but most of, we'll get on the phone to like collaborate or Zoom or whatever like this. And we just talk for two hours. <laughs> And then at the end of that, we're like, ah, oh, we should probably like maybe actually do some music stuff or like answer some of these questions or like get a playing demo or something going mm -hmm. on. Right. And then we do and it's fine. But like the I think the the point there is that our relationship is not built off of you can do this thing for me. We can help each other out. I can do this thing for you. You know, it's more of like a you're a human to making music. I'm a human making music we have something to bond on. We can talk about like, we're in a similar boat kind of thing, you know? Um, in terms of like actually writing and actually working with the people, I think that's like a, maybe a step to, from the moment that you can start collaborating or the earlier you can start collaborating um, and have these moments of like group idea input, um, the better. Cause I've had some times where I go into um, like a meeting session with an ensemble that maybe I've never met with before, whoever, um, a friend of a friend or something, and I have an idea for a piece and I think it's going to be great and cool and they're not really into it. Um, and so like, what do you do in that situation? Like, do you write what you wanted to write anyway? Do you like sacrifice your values whatever that means to make your piece fit what they want or do you do something completely different um and my question in this situation for my old self was like well what would have happened if you went in and asked them what they liked and wanted to do first um instead of just coming in with these ideas that you wanted to have done um i think at the end of the day you know composers aren't like puppet master people like to control performers and make them play their music or whatever it's like a a friendship genuine like how do you navigate all of the things around making art with someone else that also does it um so yeah in that old case i would have been like well what do y'all like to do um and now most of the time whenever i start collaborating with someone i'm like tell me things you hate like tell me things that you really don't want me to write like you don't want to scream? Cool. You don't want scratch tone? Got it. Like, because a lot of people will be like, I really don't like blank or something like that. A lot of people know what they don't like. Mm -hmm. um, and then they sound pretty good on almost everything else. And then they don't, they don't tell you what they like. Some people are like, I like lyrical altissimo playing. Jeffrey. Um, 
And so sometimes you write lyrical autismo, you know? Um, it depends on your person. But yeah, it starts from there, I think. I think that's where... And then it's nice because, I mean, they know the instrument. If they know you, they know, like, kind of your gist as a person. They know, like, your thought process, kind of. And they, like, y'all can come up with something together that then you can go on um, and write about. Whenever you're actually writing writing, um, my first inclination for no matter what it is, is write whatever you feel first, right? Whatever you think you're hearing, right? Whatever you think you want them to do first. Get all that out and then take it to them. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is where like the actual collaboration starts. Like, so I could write a thing for solo saxophone or whatever, and I'd be like, I only want you to play altissimo D and higher at pianissimo because I think it's like a really cool, quiet, whispery, like broken swing kind of sound or something like that. And you're like, no, <laughs> you're like, not for me. Then you change it. And most of the times the performer is like, well, that's real hard to do up there. But I can do it in this range, I can do it in these ranges. If you wanted the, like, the high pitches, but quieter, like, these pitches work better, you know, you can just open that dialogue about, like, what's happening in the mm -hmm. piece, what goals you're trying to get out of it. And they become kind of, like, little complescents. Um, I told Hannah that a lot, because, um, I don't know, I like, and we would meet, like, every two weeks and, like, have these, like, two-hour conversations and then, like, go through the music and do all these other things. And I'd be like, you know, these feel like my complescents now, because you know, we're learning from each other, we're collaborating. And I think that's like the best way for it to happen. And it wouldn't have happened if me and Hannah just didn't meet in comp studio and we're like, oh my God, hey, what's up? You know, like it wouldn't have happened if we didn't go to beggars after <laughs> comp studio or like all these other things where we're just being friends and fun and all these things first. Um, and I think a lot of the times on both sides, performer and composer, um, we think so much about our career and about like what's going to be the commission that gets me the job on both sides. Like who can I commission to show that I am like into new music and do all the stuff. And then on the composer side, it's like, who can one just commission me at all. And then two can commission me, but like, we'll get the word out and do all these other things. And I think you can mitigate a lot of that by being genuine and upfront at the beginning, um, about like who you are and things like that. Um, the reason to write whatever you want first is because it's always easier to pull things back than it is to, like, expand on them and make mm -hmm. them more. Um, because you can, I mean, you can, it's really easy to rein stuff in. Because you can just be like, this, I understand what you're going for, but it won't work. <laughs> and it's like, then you can go on and be like, well, what makes it not work? Is it the leap into it? Is it the range specifically? Is it that I'm having you at a dynamic? And then you learn more about the like the instrument and the idiosyncrasies of um, you know what you're writing for, um, and that works on every single instrument, which is one of the other beautiful things. Is like you don't have to be scared about writing for something if you have a friend that plays that instrument that you're working with because they'll tell you <laughs> or they'll help you out there. Um, and then okay, so the last thing. So we've got the like, don't be scared, you got it, be a friend, be genuine, be yourself, to go with them from the get-go, like have a collaborator in mind, try to generate everything as a group um, first, and then go off into your little cells of practice, and then come up with all of the ideas that you can, maybe not all of them, maybe even just one, I don't know, it depends on the person, and then get it back in touch with your performer friend, um, get some constructive feedback. And then the last part is actually change what they tell you to change, actually listen to their feedback. It's that simple. <laughs> um, the amount of times that that has happened to me where like, especially in string music, right? Cause I don't play string instruments. Um, but like, I really like them and I like writing for them cause they can do a lot and it's really cool and it's fun. Um, like I was working with, um, Wendy from um, the Rhythm Method Quartet. Um, I don't know if she's in that quartet anymore, but she is the violist, um, and I wrote a viola piece for this um, composer institute thing that I was doing, and um, I just tried it. I was just like, I don't know if I've ever written anything like this before. It's for a vocalist, um, vocal violist, so like she had to sing and play and do all these things at the same time, um, and there was only one movement 
with some harmonics that she was like, yeah, I can kind of do this, but like, maybe you mean this instead. And I was like, oh yeah, I mean that. And so then I changed it and it worked. Um, and other people can play it, but it's like those little things, like if you don't change it and you're stubborn about like, no, I want this one specific sound. And they're like, it's hard. Like it's physically hard to do, or like, I can't do it, or I don't want to do it is even valid. Then you're like, okay, well, this is the sound I'm going for. What do you have in your toolbox as a performer that can help me bridge that gap and give like some thing? Yeah, like that. I think that would help. And then on the performer side, um, to help composers, I think everyone should improvise more <laughs> um, because that builds that toolbox of like just sounds you can make. Um, and when I say improvise, I mean literally just make some sounds on your horn. Like don't try to read music, don't try to do fundamentals, just pick up the instrument, put it in your mouth, see what happens. fingers, you know, see what happens. Follow your intuition, <laughs> record it, maybe don't, I don't know. But like even just doing that as a creative process and just like it doesn't like it doesn't matter what comes out you'll surprise yourself some cool stuff will come out and you'll be like oh wow i didn't know i could trill with these fingers or i didn't know i could make a multiphonic out of that but um it's just more fun that way i don't know yeah for sure and then other tips um as i said earlier at some point listen to your collaborators warm up listen to them practice like just go in and sit on a practice session where they're playing different rep or even just when they're warming up um, cause you'll hear all the things that their instruments are built to do and how they mitigate them essentially. So like, if you hear a saxophone is warming up and you're like, why, what are these things you're doing? Like the overtones essentially, like, why are you just playing one note and then playing the same note, but it sounds a little different and then playing another note and then playing the same note, but it sounds a little different and then going between them and making a scale or whatever you're doing. Like, why are you doing that? And then you learn about voicing and then you learn about some cool overtone possibilities for different notes or for uh, like, it's another compositional technique even at that point. Um, honestly, um, I wrote Charlie a solo piece last summer and it comes from that. <laughs> it's like overtone matching, but in a piece um, because he was practicing a lot. Like he does a lot of overtones and he does them really loud. Um, and he was also doing a lot of jazz last summer. So I was like, okay, so I'm going to write something that's overtony and has like some of these figures that he works on constantly, which was like seventh arpeggios. Um, and that was all I needed. And I made a piece out of it and it worked and it's fine. Um, and it's a really weird, unique piece, I think because of the collaboration Charlie's my roommate, um, plays saxophone. We like made it in the basement, you know, it was just like. <laughs> A fun little thing um but that wouldn't have happened if i didn't know that charlie liked practicing those seventh patterns <laughs> or all these other things you know and i think something like that um that's like where you get your your in for your piece being good or whatever it is about it um it's like if it can fit to whatever your person likes to do and sometimes they don't know and they don't tell you but you hear it whenever they're practicing like, oh, you really liked that one lick in the whatever because you played it 487 times. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only other thing that I can say on solo stuff is like, um, um, Yaz wrote a piece for me. Um, we wrote each other pieces as our commission fee, which is real fun. Um, mm -hmm. It's also fun to have performer composer friends like that because you get to do stuff like that. Um, but so they knew I really liked Philip Glass. Um, and like a minimalist kind of aesthetic um, and like line and all these other things. And they interpreted, interpreted, interpreted it um, in a way that has like an angular thing happening with melody at the same time. Um, and then also then turns into this kind of minor third Philip Glass kind of extended technique -y sound thing at the end. But like, it turns into like a language that I'm really into listening to and really comfortable like making and playing and all these other things. And so I think that was a really like, you know, that was a triumph of a collaboration there because they knew like what I liked to listen to and what I could play. And I think that's like, it was great. Um, I think that's another insight is getting with your performers and just listening to music 
Um, and it doesn't even have to be like classical music or, mm -hmm. you know, just listening to whatever music and finding out why they like a thing. Um, like maybe they like um, EDM because there's a bass drop and you're like, well, how could I put a bass drop in this piece with piano and tuba or whatever, <laughs> you know? Um, so just things like that, I think, are, are the most important. Yeah, for sure. And, and I love what you're getting at is that like, like the main point of this, and I think a lot of young students keep thinking that this collaboration thing is a transaction. And, and what I think you're talking about is building a community around what you do. It just so happens that you're inviting someone into the practice room now or the composition studio to take advantage of, of each other's skills to be able to make something together, right? I think I think a lot of us, even when it comes to playing solo music, uh, or, or we're addressing solo music but this is much more fun when you get to do it with someone else all right i mean you know even in this um, medium of playing a solo saxophone piece knowing that that you have a hand in creating something with someone else it, it makes the whole process much more engaging much more exciting and it comes across in the performance of his music so you know keaton's outlined so many incredible things to be doing and none of this happens in an instant, right? It's not like, okay, here's my credit card, scan it for like, and like get a $5,000 piece or, you know? And and I think starting with your immediate network is something that's really important and, and, and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, I, I think has been something that I've had to learn through, like with people like Keaton who have like coached me along the way, you know, he's pushed me through my comfort zones, but has made me a better artist and musician for it in many ways. And that's one of the many things that I, I think is why he and I are such dear friends is that like, he knows when to push my buttons, but also um, knows when, when to like, okay, he needs to be comfortable right now. Right. But like he, I, Keaton likes to push buttons. I'll just say that. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. So this has been a, such awesome. an incredible and informative session. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with us and engaging in this conversation, which is so different from, um, I think what I'm used to hearing. So I, I've learned so much today. So, uh, thank you so much, Keaton. I hope that we get to make music together again very soon. Oh, we will. And thank you, Jeff. Um, not only, you know, just for being friends and all that stuff, but, um, and it's silly because like, I mean, like, I'm sure people will be able to like see this and be like, oh, they're friends. They know each other, whatever. But at the same time, I mean, like, is that not what I just said <laughs> about collaboration? Um, and you know, I do love you. But also at the same time, um, you know, I don't know many people in our community that are doing as much in terms of like resource creation, content, um, just like letting people know what's out there, being um, visible and like, you know, actually really advocating for all of your friends in some kind of way. I don't know many people that actually do that. So, and especially at the level <laughs> and frequency that you do. So <laughs> thank you for the series. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having like Charlie on and, you know, like literally all the things that you do for the community, Jeff, you know, I, I'm not the only one that notices it. Um, and, you know, you also need to hear that and know that. Yeah, Keaton, you, you're someone that always keeps me very humble, very honest with myself, too. It's just, uh, you, you know, I've, I've gone through a lot together and uh, thank you for that. That means a lot. So, um, yeah, look forward to what's to come. It's just a matter of time. And as the sun shines in Michigan, um, <laughs> there's that smile. All right, great. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Okay. Bye, Jeff. Love ya.